Adults in Only Mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to WM Environmental's web afternoon webinar on vapor intrusion. It's not just hot air. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping notes really quick before we get started. Um, this will be an interactive webinar. We will have a few poll questions throughout, so we would appreciate your um, your uh, cooperation in that. And if you have any questions, you can type them in your toolbar, and we will get them as, to them as quickly as possible. But if, if, if we start to run a little long and we can't get to the questions, um, I will make sure that Frank gets uh, the questions emailed to him, and he will uh, email your the answers. Um, and also, we are offering the certificate of attendance. Um, so if you want one, you can email me, Lance French. Um, it's lfrench at wh-m.com. So well, let's get started. I want to introduce uh, Frank Clark. He's a uh, professional engineer and a professional geologist who's been a project manager or principal in charge of over 1,500 environmental and geotechnical engineering projects throughout the northeastern and southwestern United States and as well as in Europe. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in science and civil engineering from Tufts University and a master of science in civil engineering from MIT. Uh, Frank's been with uh, W&M Environmental for the last 10 years and is one of the leading experts in vapor intrusion in Texas. So Frank, um, thanks for joining us today and I, and I will just turn it over to you. Thank you, Lance. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking time from your day to join us for this webinar. Um, vapor intrusion has really been a hot topic over the past few years, uh, but you could say that we are still really in the adolescent stages, at least here in Texas, regarding how to investigate, evaluate, and mitigate potential vapor intrusion issues. Some other states and regions are much further uh, ahead of Texas on VI issues, but uh, reading the literature uh, that's out there, it seems that we still, as an industry, have a long way to go to really fully understand how to most efficiently evaluate and address vapor intrusion issues. Uh, this talk will be rather general in nature, but uh, we'll go through most of the major issues that hopefully you're interested in hearing about. Uh, we'll give you a flavor for what each of those are, uh, how vapor is being evaluated, and some of the approaches that we've used and seen used uh, for mitigation uh, of vapor into structures. If you have ever been involved with an environmental site investigation, and presumably uh, many of you, the attendees uh, are familiar with those, you know that they often involve principally sampling of soil and groundwater. Soil gas has been used historically uh, in many environmental investigations, but principally or more likely as an indicator uh, of uh, source areas uh, in the subsurface using soil gas to try to find a source area of contamination or to help track a dissolved groundwater plume by using multiple inexpensive soil gas samples rather than expensive monitoring wells. Um, however, after some gasoline plumes caused some severe vapor issues in the Northeast, particularly in situations where there were basements uh, of structures and, and proximate to closed gasoline tanks, uh, it's believed that the issue of vapor intrusion into structures became uh, to the forefront where we had uh, gasoline accumulations in basements, potential explosive situations, and ergo the, the, the logical uh, evolution of thinking that these vapors could get into the overlying structures. So is this our first foray into the world of vapor intrusion? Uh, really far from it. Uh, as engineers and scientists, we, we've been dealing with vapor issues of other kinds for many decades. Uh, methane, for example, uh, is a, an example of a serious vapor issue for sites located near solid waste landfills. Uh, many of you may know that methane accumulations of uh, as low as 5% within an enclosed space can cause an explosive situation, uh, and there have been many serious consequences from methane accumulation in basements, in uh, equipment rooms, and even in manholes uh, where there could be a, a spark that could cause an explosion of the methane gas. Um, radon has also been around for decades, so we all know that radon is a naturally occurring radioactive decay, uh, product from the decay of radioactive material 
uh, in bedrock, naturally occurring radioactive material. And many parts of the country have long established programs for radon evaluation and radon mitigation measures such as vents and fans in uh, both residential and uh, commercial properties. Well, now the, the conversation has switched over to discuss other types of vapor, and these are toxic volatile organic compounds. And uh, these are obviously quite important because uh, these compounds can have a direct impact on human health. Many of them uh, create severe health issues, and many of them are known carcinogens. So there's a heightened awareness with regard to vapor associated with this, these volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. A few terms of art uh, that uh, are used in the industry, one you might have heard of is called vapor encroachment. It's really the, the presence of COC vapors in the subsurface on a property that's caused by a release of vapors from either that property or from a target uh, from a nearby property. Uh, vapor encroachment simply said is uh, the presence of vapors on a property, not necessarily in a building or under a building, but on a property and is the obvious precursor to the next issue, which is uh, if we have vapor on our property, uh, what's the potential for it causing harm to uh, our buildings or the occupants of our buildings? And that's where we uh, enter the realm of vapor intrusion. And for purposes of this presentation, uh, EPA is generally considered vapor intrusion to be uh, the migration of volatile chemicals from contaminated soil or groundwater into overlying structures or buildings. One of the principal chemicals that we're concerned about, uh, we'll talk about the, the family of chemicals that the BI uh, encompasses. However, the, the main ones that we routinely encounter and are commonly found in an, our environmental investigations, uh, there's a few families of compounds, the principal ones being uh, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, as well as the octane booster MTBE, and these, as you probably know, are all aromatic VOCs associated with gasoline or similar petroleum products. These are universally located because everyone has or uses gasoline on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and uh, they're quite commonly encountered uh, in both soil, air, and water. Uh, trichloroethylene is another uh, compound that has reached prominence in the vapor intrusion world, uh, mainly because of its toxicity. Uh, TCE, uh, if you've been involved in environmental investigations, is used uh, in almost every industry from the largest industrial manufacturer making automobiles or engine turbines all the way down to the corner garage that might be cleaning a, a part that they're using to rebuild uh, a motor. It's widely used, degreaser, uh, very effective, uh, reasonably priced, and uh, therefore it is very, very commonly found on many industrial sites. The third family of compounds that we see routinely is associated with dry cleaning, and that's tetrachloroethylene, uh, or PCE. And uh, even though PCE has been phased out over the past few years due to its toxicity and uh, the costs, associated with taxes put on PCE use. Uh, it's still used widely and there's still many uh, historical uh, sites that have used uh, PCE in the past where there have likely been releases that are as yet undiscovered. In addition to these main compounds, uh, there's an, a whole other family of uh, solvents and, and cleaners that are uh, routinely found on sites uh, carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, uh, acetone, etc., that are used in common household cleaning products. Uh, there are other volatile chemicals that uh, are listed as potential vapor intrusion concerns. However, in, in our experience, at least, they're uh, much further down the list in terms of their likelihood to be, be a problem on a, on a routine site. So a little uh, model, a simplistic schematic of uh, the mechanisms for vapor intrusion. Um, uh, first of all, volatiles will migrate due to uh, advection, which is movement by a pressure gradient, or by dispersion, which is mo movement by uh, molecular flow from points of high concentration to points of low concentration. 
this schematic shows a typical groundwater plume with uh, either a, a highly contaminated source area of soil or, or separate phase product. And the arrows simply show the upward migration of volatile compounds, which uh, prefer to be in the vados zone or the, or the, the air uh, component rather than absorbed onto soil or water. And as they migrate uh, up through the soil mass uh, and encounter an overlying structure, we can see they uh, have a capability to enter basements, crawl spaces, uh, through utility conduits, uh, and through other slabs, crack, uh, slab cracks, uh, penetrations of a typical slab into an occupied space. Um, this is exacerbated a little bit because many buildings will have a, a bit of a negative pressure based upon their, their building HVAC system or just naturally occurring things such as uh, stack effects where wind will create uh, negative pressures within buildings and therefore provide an opportunity for these vapors to migrate from the subsurface uh, into the building. So where did the vapors originate? Uh, they are found both in soil, water, and void spaces in the subsurface. And as I indicated, they will migrate preferentially uh, into the vapor phase when the conditions are right, initiating, initiating the entire vapor migration phenomenon. And uh, these can be VOCs that are absorbed onto the soil, that are already uh, in the pore space above the water table, so they've already migrated perhaps from a contaminated soil matrix into the voids around the soil. Uh, they can be chemicals dissolved in groundwater, which will uh, volatilize into the overlying uh, voids spaces. Or well, they can be chemicals emanating from separate phase product, which are extreme cases, but still quite common, where we find separate phase uh, floating product or even dense product, what we call non-aqueous phase liquids, which are obviously a very strong source of chemicals that uh, will cause vapors to uh, emanate into the overlying soils. Uh, this is a schematic showing a uh, what we would call a, a source area site. This is uh, typical of a refinery perhaps uh, with some storage tanks and maybe a vehicle repair area uh, where we might have a release from tanks that migrates vertically down to the soil mass and reaches groundwater resulting in uh, soil contamination uh, groundwater plume and possibly separate phase product, for example, in the case of diesel fuel or gasoline or some other similar uh, material. Uh, the groundwater moves horizontally, um, spreading the plume. Uh, under the truck repair area, we might simply have contaminated soil, which is not severe enough to reach the groundwater table, yet is shallow and uh, has the potential to create a vapor problem in, uh, say, a structure say a garage uh, located overlying that contaminated soil. Uh, the, the contaminants will often move through the path of least resistance. So if we have sandy soils, porous soils, uh, fissures within fractured clays, uh, or utility corridors, these will all be pathways that will uh, attract and, and, and accelerate the movement of volatiles from the subsurface to the surface. And then a second situation here, this is in the case where we have a, a property that is not the source of the contamination, but that has been impacted by perhaps a plume migrating onto the site from an off-site source. Again, we you know, schematically show a, a plume of groundwater, perhaps with uh, contaminated and perhaps with separate phase product, and commercial and residential structures uh, with or without basements, and again, opportunities for vapors to migrate into these overlying structures from this contaminated groundwater plume. So what chemicals do we focus on when we are looking at vapor intrusion? Uh, clearly ones that have a high volatile potential, so those with high vapor pressures and uh, those that are sufficiently toxic that they would be a, a health concern. Uh, EPA a number of years ago evaluated thousands of chemical compounds and basically came up with what I call a short list of about 160 that they considered to have the highest potential for uh, being vapor intrusion uh, concerns on sites. Now in, in our experience of these 160, there's, there's maybe 30 or 40 that 
really seem to be the most problematic and they do tend to be uh, the volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and they're the ones we typically see and look for when we're doing these investigations. All right, well, I will um, launch the first poll question that we have, which is, um, what percentage of time would you expect to find VOCs in indoor air in the absence of any known source of contamination, um, example, ambient conditions? And I believe I launched it, but I'm going to go ahead and launch it one more time. There we go. Frank, that will be up there for just a second. So if you want to go ahead and move to the next slide, and then I'll um, close this when people are done voting. Okay. I'm going to wait a few seconds because the next slide kind of has a, a response based upon some some uh, studies about how often we see it. So I'll just wait a few seconds here sure. so people have a chance to respond. They're still trickling in. Okay, I'll okay. move on here. Yep. Well, here's, uh, I guess, a part answer to that, that question. Uh, background values for common air contaminants. Uh, there's been many, many studies where air, indoor air was evaluated in, I think, seven or eight states across the country under various conditions uh, and the EPA did a comprehensive review of this data in, in 2011 and they uh, published the results and uh, really some staggering numbers came out of it when I read it. Um, about 80 percent of the samples that were analyzed and these are in indoor air situations obviously some maybe with the potential for uh, man-made contamination but others uh, likely background conditions 80 percent reported some levels of either benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, or xylene in indoor air. Uh, and this uh, is amazing, but then when you think about benzene, uh, these compounds associated with gasoline, and gasoline being a, uh, a material that is used by all of us on a daily basis, both in our motor vehicles, perhaps in uh, gasoline powered equipment to maintain yards, uh, etc., uh, or generators, uh, maybe it's not. In, completely surprising, but the fact that it would be found within the indoor air, often in residences, um, is uh, was interesting. So we do know we have elevated levels of, or detectable levels of these compounds in indoor air. Another surprising finding was that 40 to 60 percent of the samples contained one of the chlorinated VOCs that uh, we typically find problematic and most often associate with industrial activities, and those are TCE, the degreaser I discussed, uh, PCE, which is a dry cleaning solvent, uh, dichloroethylene, trichloroethane, carbon tetrachloride, um, and these are compounds that are found in a number of household products, not only industry, and some samples are uh, some household cleaners, if you ever had that little spot remover that you can take a spot out of your suit with uh, that contains uh, tetrachloroethylene, lubricants, air fresheners, shoe polish, uh, many adhesives, water repellents, lubricants, uh, aerosols, insect repellents, and then building materials such as uh, carpet glue, uh, obviously paints, uh, VOC based paints, and wood finishing products. And they've also found uh, from uh, smoking and cooking in homes will create levels of uh, aromatic VOC. Smoking, in particular, benzene is a byproduct. And uh, people will have uh, dry cleaning in their house, uh, which is not completely free of dry cleaning solvent when it's uh, returned to the house. So you can see very trace levels of that. So uh, the, the story is that uh, these chemicals uh, seem to be ubiquitous and low levels uh, certainly not toxic levels, but low levels are detected on a routine basis whenever we do uh, environmental investigations. I'll go ahead and share the poll results with you guys there. So, so Frank, what do are, what are these results tell you? I can't see that screen, Lance. Sorry about that. It basically says 36% uh, said 10% 
Uh, 41% said 25%. Um, 9% of the uh, polls, pollsters said 75%. And then 14% said that it was a 100% source mm -hmm. of contamination. <clears throat> Yeah, so the data shows it's really on the higher side. It's uh, generally a 40 to 80 percent. Uh, we're finding some type of, of chemicals, uh, and um, so uh, yeah, it's a it's quite a high number and higher than I I think most of the people would have expected. Okay, so how do we what triggers uh, vapor intrusion studies? How do we reach the point where one is considered necessary? Um, many of you may be familiar with phase one site assessments, which uh, drive the market for many of the environmental investigations we have. Historically, vapor intrusion was not really considered uh, a key component of a phase one ESA because the, the standard excluded indoor air quality from the scope. So people interpreted that to mean that indoor air quality, regardless of the source of the uh, problem was not necessarily to be necessary to be considered in a phase one. Um, There's a lot of uh, inconsistency in the industry, uh, and uh, the ASTM developed a standard for vapor encroachment and vapor intrusion in 2008, revised it in 2010, and I think a combination of that standard, which really put the spotlight on vapor issues and revisions of the ASTM standard in 2013 um, brought more clarity to the market uh, indicating that vapor intrusion in particular uh, vapor, or vapor conditions arising from external environmental conditions like soil and groundwater must be considered during the course of phase one. So I think the industry now is uh, congealed a little bit more. We are seeing uh, reports where Vapor is being identified as a recognized environmental condition, possibly warranting additional uh, research study or even uh, phase two investigations to determine if it's uh, a potential issue. Uh, the ASCM standard, just briefly, you won't go into it in detail, but uh, was a development of a tiered concept to identify areas of concern and critical distances. Um, the tier one approach really identified the potential for a vapor encroachment condition and then the tier two approach was to get some more specific information based upon either reviewing existing documents or even doing some site testing to determine if a vapor intrusion issue was uh, was possible. Uh, boiled down to its uh, substance, uh, the, the general consensus was that if you were located within a hundred feet of the extent of known contamination, either soil or water, with uh, volatile organic compounds, then there is a potential for a vapor intrusion condition, a vapor encroachment condition. Uh, for petroleum hydrocarbons, that distance was uh, 30 feet, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, the literature and, and anecdotal and, and field in, uh, information shows that petroleum hydrocarbons have a much greater ability to attenuate with distance because in the presence of oxygen many of these petroleum hydrocarbons will degrade naturally. So uh, Mother Nature is doing her own little cleanup for petroleum hydrocarbons and therefore the, the distance for concern for those are much less. Uh, clearly when we're doing vapor studies understanding the gradient <coughs> at, at and the other site is important so we know that if the source is either up gradient, cross gradient, or down gradient from our target property is a, a big assumption and, and piece of information we need to know to see if uh, our site is likely to be impacted. Um, quickly getting into the how do we evaluate uh, vapor intrusion. We obviously look at common sense information such as the location of the contaminant source in relation to the receptor. Uh, what's the mechanism for transport from point A to point B? Is it through soil, uh, through groundwater migration, which is the most common? Are the chemicals of concern particularly volatile and toxic and therefore warrant consideration? Uh, what's the gradient from, from uh, A to B? So we evaluate that potential and, and then possibly develop a sampling program if we think that potential is real. And this is where we get into some more specific information about 
uh, is are there contaminants of concern uh, at concentrations that represent a problem. Um, some of the difficulties in any vapor intrusion uh, study are that vapor movement in the subsurface is very complex, as complex as we, we know groundwater migration is, uh, but even more so um, because uh, the migration of the chemical will vary the based upon the, the properties of that chemical, how deep below the uh, building the chemical is located, what type of soil is present, clay, soil, uh, clay, sand, silt, is there stratigraphy that would mitigate or, or prevent certain migrations such as clay layers? Uh, is there moisture in the soil that again would retard the movement of all our organics? So those are the difficulties we have in the subsurface or the complexities. Uh, and then once the chemical maybe has an opportunity to reach the building envelope, we have a whole other set of complexities because every building is different. Uh, we know that a building constructed in 2014 or 15 will be in very good condition, hopefully with no cracks in the slab and well sealed and well built, whereas a building constructed in 1940 uh, will not have those same benefits. Um, expansion joints, construction joints can be different. Uh, some are filled, some are not. Uh, some are open, some are closed. And those all affect the ability for vapors to enter the structure. Uh, floor penetration, such as drains, utility pipes, clearly avenues for vapor movement. And then uh, the HVAC system. Uh, is there one? And uh, if there is, how does it operate? Uh, what type of pressure, uh, negative or positive, is in the building under typical operating conditions? And then to complicate all of this, we have the, the uh, anomalous conditions such as sand layers or utility trenches or other man-made features that uh, cause the migration to go in a direction completely uh, unanticipated uh, during the initial model development. So finally we have some graphics and pictures here to show some typical situations that we've encountered on sites. Uh, the photo on the left with that green painted floor is an industrial warehouse located over a chlorinated solvent plume. Uh, this is a crack but it is a severe crack because it's a displacement crack meaning that the floor has settled and there's a displacement of about an inch between uh, one end of the crack and the other. Clearly uh, this concrete is not intact and there's opportunity for vapors to migrate uh, through uh, a crack such as this. Uh, to the right we have a construction or expansion joint in a large warehouse slab. Uh, you can see the Sorry. Uh, you can see the uh, gray slab filler that was there and is periodically absent. So it's present over certain stretches and then in other areas it's, it's uh, no longer present. And uh, that matter is supposed to prevent vapor movement uh, and also things from leaking down into the subsurface from spills on the, on the concrete floor. Uh, and you can, we're here with the PID meter screening the, the um, cracks to see if we see any evidence of volatile organics. And in the lower uh, picture we have a, uh, a sump located in the corner of a dry cleaner sweep. And again, a, a prime opportunity for volatile organics. A few more samples of uh, floor drains that we've seen in industrial buildings. Uh, the floor drains themselves uh, could be avenues for vapor movement. But when you think about it, a floor drain is often connected to some type of pipe that might run for tens or even hundreds of feet to a point of discharge, perhaps, or hopefully a sanitary sewer. And uh, all along that stretch of pipe, if the pipe is not intact and it's running through contaminated soil or, or water, um, there's an opportunity for the vapors to enter that pipe and then uh, provide a direct conduit into the building. So floor drains can be a real source of a vapor uh, intrusion, a direct pipeline, so to speak, if they are not in good condition and, and pass through uh, contaminated zones. Uh, the picture on the lower right is rather interesting. You see we have a few monitoring wells within a, an industrial building. And uh, this was a site where we did a survey for indoor vapor intrusion, including screening of slab cracks and joints, and uh, including screening of 
uh, wells that were installed within the building to evaluate groundwater contamination. And lo and behold, we found that the highest level of vapor intrusion was emanating from literally the caps of the monitoring wells that were used to study the very problem. Uh, and this was almost uniform. Whenever we had a cap without uh, a bolt hole filled, we found uh, detectable VOCs. And in one case, we found over 80 parts per million of volatile organics emanating from a little cap hole in that cover over those wells. So we went back in and resealed the wells and replaced the caps with uh, replaced the caps with liners and uh, bolts, and et cetera, and we were able to reduce the VOCs by about 98% just by that simple method. But we thought it was uh, ironic that the main mechanism for vapor intrusion on this site was, in fact, uh, the borings that were used to study the problem. All right, this brings up our... Uh, yes, we have an opportunity for this. Yeah, here's a, here's a quick poll. Let me launch it really quick. Uh, what would you expect would be the best type of subsurface data to collect to evaluate the potential for VI? Is it groundwater data under the building, soil data under the building, soil vapor data under the building? And I'll give you guys a chance to, uh, to vote on that. Frank, I do have a question from the audience. Um, what would be some of the first signs that you would see if you had vapor intrusion in your building? Well, un unfortunately, many of the, the compounds are uh, not, uh, not able to be detected by the nose. Uh, some are at low concentration, benzene in particular, and some others have very low odor thresholds. But I, unless you had relatively higher concentrations, you may not find it uh, find it any different than going into a building after the cleaning crew has been there. Mm. Uh, you, you smell cleaning chemicals. Um, many of these, I don't think they would be detected by the nose at concentrations that that would raise your eyebrows. Um, so that is the the difficulty here. Uh, there could be low levels uh, above health concerns that. I think most people would not detect uh, on a on a routine basis. Okay. All right. I'm I'll move on with the okay. next slide, and then yep. we can come back to the results. Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Um, just quickly, uh, groundwater studies. Uh, if we have an offsite uh, plume of contamination, and we think it might be headed towards the target property. Uh, one of the easiest things to do is to just take some samples at the property boundary uh, to see if that plume is migrated onto the site. And that would be the first indicator that you could have a, a vapor encroachment problem. Again, that would be the presence of the chemical on the property. And then that would lead to uh, the next step, which would be, okay, it's, it's, it's off the property. It hasn't arrived on the site. And if that's the case, you can probably at that point exclude vapor intrusion uh, as being an issue. Of course, if you do find it at the property line, then you start to look at what are the concentrations. Uh, do we need to move in closer to the structure and get additional data, either soil or soil gas, uh, to, uh, to to see if it's migrated to the building? Obviously, getting a hydraulic gradient would be important, which would involve putting in probably at least three wells uh, to see if the if the plume is migrating towards the structure. Now, hopefully, uh, the responses to the, the, the poll might be up, but uh, the best method for evaluating soil uh, movement into a, and, and into a building would be some type of soil gas sampling. Uh, we can do soil gas outside of a building, which is a good indicator of how much is moving up uh, into the shallow soils from underlying groundwater. And uh, this is a case where we were working on a new site development <coughs> and had monitoring wells with groundwater data and repaired them with uh, soil vapor points to 
to correlate the groundwater concentrations to the soil vapor concentrations and uh, determine if we had a potential vapor intrusion issue. Um, I have to admit that correlations between groundwater data and soil vapor data that, that I have seen are not great um, because there can be so many complex mechanisms that are affecting the ability of the contaminant to migrate from the groundwater into the Vado zone. And therefore, there's, uh, I think right now, I don't think we have a good correlation that's more of a qualitative correlation rather than a quantitative. Lance, do we have the results of the poll? Yeah, um, the results are 19% uh, said groundwater data under the building. 11% um, said soil data under the building, and then 70% said soil vapor data under the building. Right. Well, that's right. Soil vapor uh, under the building is the best. Um, I'll go to another slide which just shows some exterior soil vapor sampling. Uh, here's a site outside of a dry cleaner. We have nests of uh, monitoring wells, uh, and nearby we have soil vapor points. And again, we're trying to draw a correlation between what was in the water and what was in the soil. Um, but the best is sub-slab soil gas sampling. And uh, there are uh, guidelines and uh, correlations for sub-slab to indoor air uh, that have been used and are being refined. It's considered the most representative really because uh, you're getting data of well, volatile organic compounds directly beneath your slab, and then the only question is, uh, what is the attenuation factor from beneath that slab into the building? And so it's probably the most reliable data. I'd say the correlations are best, and the, uh, the medium that you need to go through now is just from directly beneath the slab into the structure, and that still is a difficult uh, pathway to quantify, but it avoids a lot of the other uh, unknown such as uh, soil type beneath that or migration from groundwater. So in our experience, soil gas beneath the building is the best. And yeah. we do, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Frank, we do have a, a quick question from the audience if, if this would be a good time. Um, gradient is a factor. Groundwater flows down gradient, but can vapors migrate up gradient to a site that is higher than the source of contamination? The, um, the guidance that, that ASTM developed and, um, <clears throat> and is based upon models and literature has suggested that vapors will move uh, not necessarily in direction of groundwater flow, but they can move through preferential pathways, for example, horizontal sand lenses or fractures in clay, and therefore they have recommended that these 100-foot uh, and 30-foot lateral distances that I mentioned uh, are I'd say conservative, but they are distances that they're considering that a gas could move from a contaminated groundwater uh, to uh, through the soil mass to a structure. So uh, the answer is yes, it can move uh, contrary to groundwater flow because uh, stratigraphy will probably govern uh, movement in the saturated, unsaturated zone more than groundwater. And we do know that there are pipes, utilities, sand lenses. Uh, et cetera, that can be uh, preferential pathways for gas migration, and I think ASTM considered that when they developed their uh, critical distances uh, in their standard. So the answer is yes, they can. <clears throat> um, Subslab soil gas, again, has been the most effective that we have found. Uh, we have found a very interesting and, and uh, easy to use approach uh, by using what we call vapor pins. In the upper left, you see a brass machined pin with a silicone tubing. Uh, we drill a one and a half inch hole into the slab and for about an inch depth, and then we drill a five eighths inch hole completely through the slab until it reaches the sub slab uh, layer, gravel or sand, whatever it might be. Uh, then this uh, probe can be hammered into that five eighths inch hole. The silicone tubing provides a tight fit between the brass and the concrete. Uh, the probe can then be uh, leak tested to make sure that we have a tight fit and uh, then it can be sampled. And In the right hand picture you see a probe in place. Uh, you can see we pulled up a carpet tile and uh, hammered that down into place and then we're taking a, a sample with the summa canister in the center. 
And uh, once we take that sample, the suma canister is closed, the piping is, the tubing is removed, and that little uh, stainless steel uh, cup you see on the left-hand side is threaded, turned upside down, and threaded onto the top of the vapor pin and ends up being exactly flush with the concrete. And then we just flip the carpet tile back. So this allows us to do vapor testing within a building with minimal intrusion. And um, in fact, when we're done, no one even knows we were there. We can do it under carpets or floor tiles or uh, in equipment rooms uh, with minimal disturbance. And it's a relatively clean and quick operation. These can be installed in 30 minutes or less by experienced people. And so uh, very quick, very inexpensive and uh, you can get good data from them and lots of it. Uh, finally, we talked about sub-slab, uh, groundwater, and uh, subsurface gas sampling. Obviously, the best indicator of vapor intrusion issue is actually measuring vapor within a building. However, uh, in my experience, this is considered a, a sampling of last resort, and I think the, the reasons are obvious. Um, well, First of all, we can compare results directly to an indoor air criteria, but in doing so, we now might have a condition where it requires a, a notification to tenants or owners. And before indoor air sampling is undertaken, uh, all the parties must be aware of uh, those requirements and uh, the notification uh, and the consequences of that, and possibly the requirement for some more immediate or very prompt remedial measures if we do have an air exceedance that uh, we think triggers some type of uh, remedial action. Um, the, one of the difficulties with indoor air sampling is the literature has shown that uh, air results inside a building can, is also very subjective and will change with season, uh, with weather conditions, high pressure versus low pressure, with operation of the HVAC system, etc. So uh, even a single sampling event within a building is generally not considered the, the end be all and end all and uh, the regulators tend to be requiring multiple uh, sampling events to either refute or confirm the presence of uh, vapors at whatever concentration. So now what do we do when we have data? So we've, we've determined we have a vapor intrusion potential, we've done some sampling, either sub-slab or or in, uh, within the building, and how is it evaluated? Well, unfortunately in Texas, and I know many of the attendees are operating in Texas, uh, the state of Texas does not have any established guidance for evaluating vapor intrusion. Uh, we've been falling back on vapor intrusion screening levels developed by the EPA. Uh, these are developed using very conservative assumptions and relatively low attenuation factors, but at least it's a beginning point. Um, and uh, if after going through that, we find we still have a, a exceed some type of screening level, then there are some off-the-shelf, easy-to-use models that can be used to input site-specific conditions such as soil parameters, depths to water, water content, etc. So uh, we can go through these various iterations <coughs> and see where that leads us in terms of whether or not we have a real vapor intrusion issue. Um, again, there's no guidance in Texas, but we are finding that the EPA and certain other states are promoting multiple lines of evidence. So they will want both subsurface and uh, indoor air sampling in many cases to uh, verify or, or refute the presence of vapor within a structure. So if we find that we do have a vapor intrusion problem, let's talk about some of the methods that have been used to abate it. Um, for, for sites where new construction is planned, obviously this is the easiest and best situation because uh, it is relatively cost effective to incorporate either an active or a passive sub-slab venting system into the structure. And uh, these often consist of layers of gravel with a perforated PVC pipe in combination with a, a heavy-duty uh, membrane, continuous membrane. And I'll show you a couple of those. And for existing structures, uh, the options that are initially are considered most often is adjusting the HVAC system to maintain a positive pressure. That is, if we have a positive pressure within the building, 
uh, it will minimize the intrusion of vapors from the subsurface. That can be hard to do in some buildings based upon how the HVAC system has been designed and installed. Another option is sub-slab depressurization, which is, has been widely used on radon projects uh, involving putting in uh, gravel line trenches and uh, putting negative pressure on those trenches and sucking air from the bedding layer beneath the slab. And I understand on vapor uh, situations that has been a very effective approach for reducing radon levels. A third approach is indoor air treatment, which is actually treating the air, assuming it's gotten into the building, we're not able to prevent that, and therefore uh, putting in interior treatment systems to uh, pull in air, run it through carbon, and then uh, discharge it as treated. And finally, source area remediation, which is obviously more of a long-term approach and as often is done in uh, concurrence with the, uh, the ones above, but obviously takes a lot longer to incorporate. So uh, it's probably that some of the first two or three options would be uh, investigated or implemented before source area remediation. So here's a few examples of some uh, uh, mitigation projects that we've been involved with. This was a residential property that had a residual from a gasoline plume originating off-site but migrated onto one corner of this property and it involved uh, installing a, a vapor mitigation system uh, in this, underneath this particular building consist, this consisted of a 30 mil high density polyethylene vapor barrier uh, overlying a 8 inch layer of, of crushed stone and this was uh, the site before they poured the concrete slab uh, you can see that there are some challenges with, with the in, installing this type of system we have a number of slab penetrations through those vertical pipes. Those are pipes, for example, for bath, bathrooms or vents uh, that uh, must go through the concrete slab. So each of those vent pipes is, uh, must be covered with a boot, and that boot taped down to the layer. So labor intensive. Um, and in addition, we have pipes that collect the vapors that run horizontally through this morass of, of white and uh, collect the vapors and are run through an interior wall up to the roof line. <clears throat> Another uh, system that's been more widely advertised and probably more widely used is a, a spray applied barrier system such as the ones uh, marketed by Liquid Boot or uh, Land Science Technology. I believe this is a picture of a, a GeoSeal which is a a product developed by Land Science Technology, which is a composite of uh, a layer of polyethylene uh, over uh, that is overlain by a spray applied bitumen. That spray applied bitumen is applied at a thickness of 60 milliliters, uh, which is a pretty significant thickness. Um, and then that 60 mils is then covered with a second layer of polyethylene, which is a, a bit of a protective layer. So this is a three composite system. Uh, the advantage of it is when you have pipe penetration to the slab is this uh, spray applied system allows you to just go around each pipe uh, and uh, spray apply the seal to each pipe which gives a much better seal than possibly the boot system used with a, a typical HDPE liner. Uh, GeoSeal also has a venting component that you can place underneath this layer and that venting layer <coughs> Uh, can be again tied into a, uh, a stack or some piping to vent any vapors that accumulate beneath the geoseal uh, harmlessly to the atmosphere. For existing structures, uh, the easiest approach, as I mentioned, is a positive pre pressure by the HVAC system, but this is not always possible. Um, sealing of cracks and joints is uh, an easy and relatively inexpensive fix. You see in the lower left, uh, lower right. Uh, it's a picture of us sealing some uh, construction joints at the perimeter of a concrete slab where the slab uh, met up with the exterior foundation wall uh, using a VOC free uh, grout uh, that is uh, intentionally used for uh, use with concrete joints, to seal concrete joints. Um, another option is indoor air purifiers. You see here a, 
uh, a purifier that sits in this particular location. Uh, these purifiers can hold 20 to 30 pounds of granular activated carbon and can run uh, at variable speeds, at low speeds. They're very, very quiet. You don't even know that they're on. And they can uh, pull in up to 500 cubic feet per minute of air. So you can get a lot of air treatment with this little floor-mounted fan that just runs on 110 volt electricity and uh, really will not disturb the occupants of the building any more than a, an air purifier would or a little uh, floor fan. <clears throat> The other two methods for existing structures are sealing of the entire floor surfaces and sub-slab depressurization. I think this next slide talks about a, one of the existing products that's out there for sealing a slab. Uh, this is a retro coat, which is made again by, I believe, Land Science Technologies. Um, this is a material specifically designed for vapor intrusion. It's chemically resistant to most of the chemicals we've discussed. Um, it has no VOCs in it, has no odors. <clears throat> it's rated for industrial traffic, so shortly after installation it hardens to a surface that can be used in industrial applications and uh, can also be customized for looks, uh, for I think skid resistant uh, materials, etc. So uh, it looks to be pretty, a pretty good alternative if you think you have a, a large floor area with multiple opportunities for vapor. Uh, intrusion. So in summary, um, vapor is the next big thing in environmental liability. We've gone through a number of phases in the environmental market. We started with Superfund and went on to underground storage tanks and then to dry cleaners and uh, now we're into vapor. And uh, we're still, as I say, on the adolescent stage. The market is developing and the regulators are still trying to get to grips with what their requirements are going to be and uh, in Texas in particular we're still struggling with what their requirements will be. But we should expect that vapor intrusion will be an issue on many real estate deals, in particular if those deals are located in urban areas where there's lots of historical gas stations, printers, dry cleaners, other light industries that uh, could have used these volatile chemicals. And of course, a, a big driver for a lot of what we do in the environmental industry is lender requirements. Uh, and they will be adding vapor intrusion to their due diligence checklists. So uh, as environmental professionals and as uh, purchasers, uh, we need to be aware that vapor intrusion will be asked and needs to be looked at during the course of uh, uh, site due diligence. The standards in te <coughs> Texas are not well defined. Uh, we've been relying on standards and precedents established by the EPA and in other states. So far, they've they seem to uh, vote us well. We have submitted many reports to the TCQ, and they seem to be accepting of the general approaches. But uh, again, we're waiting for their them to come up with their own guidance so that we know exactly where we stand and can advise our clients on where they stand. Um, and finally, vapor mitigation approaches have been well established, mostly in other states, but um, uh, we know that there are mechanisms out there to deal with vapor on new construction and on existing construction. Uh, obviously, the success of any vapor mitigation system <clears throat> will be very site and building dependent, but there are mechanisms and tools out there, and we're confident that they'll continue to be refined so that we can address vapor intrusion uh, in whatever situation it might, might arise. So that's the end of my talk, and I uh, <clears throat> am available to answer questions, and uh, I hope this was beneficial and useful, and uh, you're able to pick up some tidbits about vapor intrusion. Well, great. Uh, thank you, Frank. There's a, some, some great information there. Um, it looks like you did a great job because nobody has any questions, but um, like I said, I'll um, monitor this, and I, there is a chance that I have missed a question or two, but if in, in the um, case that I did, I'll make sure that Frank gets that, and then we'll uh, email it to you as soon as possible. But uh, as you can see, here's uh, Frank's contact information, so if you have a specific question on a specific project that you have, um, I'm sure that he'd be more than happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, you guys have a great week.